Well, in the words of Golden Girl, Sophia Petrillo, picture it, Jerusalem, A.D. 33, a man conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, attested by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him, betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, abandoned by his disciples when seized by godless men. What was just a triumphant entry where he's met with the shouts of Hosanna in the highest is now reviling and beatings and condemned to an illegal condemnation to an illegal trial and false testimony, mockingly dressed in kingly garb. Oh, little did they know that attire was fitting. Led outside of Jerusalem to a place called the Skull, then nailed to a cross, the people wagging their heads, his mother, that poor woman standing by the cross watching it all. And then those words, those marvelous words, it is finished. Then he was pierced in his side, removed and buried in a, garden, in a guarded tomb. After three days he rose, and for 40 days he was seen by many. Then he was lifted up and received by a cloud and taken into heaven, where he's met by the Father, a seen witness by only one man a thousand years prior. That man's name is David, and the one who was taken up was Jesus. Today's sermon is titled, The Lord and His Footstool. And we'll be using a three-point outline. Point number one, a king's confession, covered in verse 1a. Point number two, a king's position, covered in verse 1b. And point number three, a king's rule, covered in verse 1c. So let's read Psalm 110. We'll read the whole thing, but our focus this morning is going to be just on verse 1. Psalm 110, verses 1 through 7. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power, in holy array. From the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Our first point, a king's confession. Psalm 110 is the most quoted or alluded to psalm in the New Testament. No other place in scripture describes this scene. This messianic and royal psalm is like no other. There's no double meaning here, all right? One for the times and one for the future. There's no type or anti-type. Only one can fit the bill as the subject of this psalm. Here's where, the, where we answer the question, what happened to Christ when he got to the other side of the clouds? The New Testament tells us what happened to Christ from his resurrection to his ascension. It describes the heavenly place that he entered into. <clears throat> but in all of scripture, only it's only David who witnessed the initial reception of the son by the father, who heard the first words Yahweh spoke to his Lord. Some have called this psalm David's confession. And let's take notice of David's expression of this majestic scene. The Lord says to my Lord, the Lord, that is Yahweh, the eternal, self-sustaining, self-existent, immeasurable Lord, declaring the end from the beginning, the creator of all things. He's infinite, eternal, unchangeable in his being, all-wise, all-powerful, holy, just, pure. All his attributes run on full throttle at all times, from eternity past to now and forever. He's never unrighteous for the sake of love, never shuns truth for the sake of goodness. He is Yahweh, the Father. And Yahweh says, signifies that he's making a declaration. This phrase is mainly found in the prophets and only once here in all of the Psalms. The sense is that David is excited about this heavenly scene. He's seeing someone in glory receiving his reward. This look forward to a triumphant entry into the throne room of God has David at attention. This means something. You know, sometimes wifey speaking to me, and after a few minutes, I just zone out. Everything just starts to sound like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. 
And it always happens during the most important part of the conversation. Crucial information that could determine whether or not I'll end up in good graces with my wife. But I just wasn't paying attention. Are you at attention to what the the Lord declares in his word? Does it excite you? Or does it come off like wah, 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 wah? Many claim Christ but are not at attention. At best, they hear faintly at a distance. But that's how we get to compromise. How the Trojan horse of critical race theory gets to creep into congregations. That's how we get a church trying to appease a culture rather than speaking life into it. That's how we get a Christian who hangs God up in the closet after church and doesn't see him again until next Sunday. Was the Episcopal Church standing at attention to God's word when they accepted same-sex marriage and homosexual leaders at their church? What the Lord declares, declares is what brings you peace and comfort, restrains us from sin and strengthens us for the battles, the very thing that produces the faith and patience necessary until you inherit the promises. Does God's word govern your response to the culture or is it the other way around? Is your confession similar to David's? The Lord says to my Lord, or Yahweh says to my Adon. And the sense in this term refers to the God of Israel and reflects his authority. David is expressing reverence and worship of his Lord. Adon means the one who is the supernatural master over all. Most often used for the true God or Lord God as echoed by Thomas in John 20, 28, when he says, my Lord, my God. David's acknowledging that the one being spoken to by the Father is greater than himself. The one who would be David's son according to the flesh, David himself is calling his Lord. He is the God-man, the king's king. David confesses the Lord's authority over him. But this confession, it also implies something else. It implies intimacy. His Lord is also his redeemer. One day every knee will bow and tongue confess this very same thing, that he is Lord. Some will bow in joy and praise, others in terror and despair due to their rejection of Christ. He's everyone's Lord by right. Is he yours by redemption? Does he reign in your heart as Lord of your life? That this Lord was Messiah was widely accepted, but the perspectives varied. And, this, and this, brought, this is brought out when Jesus goes back and forth with the Pharisees in Matthew 22, 42 to 46. I'll read it again. What do you think about the Christ? Jesus says. Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? No one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. The Pharisee's silence tells us two things. One, that they believe 110 was about the Messiah, Psalm 110. And two, to answer would force them to ascribe deity to David's Lord. But that's exactly what David was doing. He's acknowledging that this was more than a descendant. It's someone greater. The Jewish perspective of Messiah was an earthly one. God's intention was a spiritual one. While they were wrong, years before, David rightly recognized his Lord when blessed with the privilege of witnessing a conversation between the father and the son. His confession of that day would have been what? The Shema. Hear, O hear, oh Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. But notice something. There's no conflict with David in calling the Messiah his Lord. David is confessing the New Testament's confession of Christ, that he is Lord. In meditation of this verse, I thought about something. It's not that hard to say, hey, Yahweh is God. It's light work to acknowledge God. Because it costs us nothing to do so, and being vague or soft in our profession, it helps us blend into the world. You know, breakdance battles have a questionable judging system. It's basically based on the judge's own personal likes. I tell Nicole, when you battle, you have to leave the judges with no choice but to call you the winner. And in like manner, in our lives, others have to have no choice but to recognize that for us, Jesus is Lord. What's your confession today? 
Well, in our first point, we see David's confession. Now, let us look at point number two, a king's position. And we're going to break down this section with three subpoints, just for clarity's sake. First subpoint, what is meant by the right hand of God? The second subpoint would be, what is the significance of Christ sitting at the right hand of God? And then last subpoint, we'll be talking about just a few benefits of Christ being at the right hand of God. So what is meant by the right hand of God? Sit at my right hand. These are the first words spoken to Christ by the Father after his ascension. The Son has returned from his mission on earth to the celebration of praise from the angels and elders in heaven. A far cry from the treatment he received on his earthly mission, though. Some of which includes beating his head with a reed, flogging, punched, slapped, spat upon, mocked at, deafening cries of crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. This is the coronation our, our Lord received at the hands of man. This is the result when you stop at God and won't surrender to his lordship. You mock and hate his provisions when Jesus doesn't turn out to be what you expected him to be. Or rather, what you wanted him to be. From the coronation of man with a crown of thorns to the coronation of God. With thunderous shouts over his triumph over sin and death. To the voices of the elders and the cherubim singing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. You know, as glorious as those cheers are, nothing arises above the reception of acceptance by the Father. Sit at my right hand. To be seated at the right hand of the Father is to be placed in a position of great honor, to be held in high esteem. This is a position of great favor. The word right here is symbolic of God's power and majesty. It can also refer to the right side of God, at the right hand of the throne in heaven. <clears throat> this was not no separate throne. The image here is, in, is like in ancient Asian thrones where, where the thrones would sometimes be as big as our sofas are today in the house. So father and son share one throne, and this is that joy that was set before him. He who endured the cross, despising the shame, is rewarded with a seat at the right hand of the father. Saints, do we look through pains of obedience in this world to the joy that is set before us? You ever think that act of obedience is too high a cost, not worth the pain? Just remember that to Christ... It was worth it. His obedience to the Father called to him to endure a suffering far beyond what you and I could ever imagine. But for that joy that was set before him, he endured. May that truth humble and strengthen us to walk in obedience. Here's a glorious encouragement to walk in obedience, no matter how hot the world turns up, the, how high the world turns up that heat. Straight from the lips of Christ in Revelation 3.21, he says, He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his. The same joy that awaited Christ awaits us. Let this promise fill your hearts with a desire to serve him faithfully, always. Be careful not to substitute that joy for something else. You don't let, don't let your heart get settled to sacrifice for worldly comforts and entertainments. Does anything in your life surpass the value of being with Christ one day? You know, Christ wasn't tied to anything but his mission. And thank God for that. And know this, Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, it doesn't mean that it's relaxed mode for Christ. Because even though his earthly work is complete, his mediatorial and intercessory work continues for our sake when he returns, until he returns. Look at Hebrews 8.1. Now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of, ma of the majesty in the heavens. So the one at the right hand of the father is not only king, but a high priest. Which leads us to our second sub-point. What is the significance of Christ sitting at the right hand of God? Well, plain and simple, if this scene doesn't happen, if this doesn't take place, these words not uttered, then we have no representative. 
no mediator between us and God, which means we would stand before him in our own righteousness, which means no hope for salvation. That this seat was delegated to Christ by the Father doesn't make him inferior to him, though. All right? This, this office itself is inferior, but the one who takes up this office is not. His earthly work is done, but a heavenly work remains, which the Lord undertakes for our sake until his return. So this does not separate Christ from his deity, okay? Nor, nor did he become divine as a result of him dying on the cross. The Bible clearly teaches of Christ's preexistence, right? He is before all things, and in him all things consist. Christ always existed as the second person of the Trinity. He remained divine while on earth, while taking on the form of a slave. He didn't use his deity to advance himself to make himself an earthly king. Christ uses his divine rights for the church. His humility and selflessness was for the benefit of his people. You know, after his earthly work, if he would have been anything like us or me, Christ could have said, I'm done with these stiff necks. Then taken off his human suit, thrown it in a 55-gallon drum, lit it up, and warmed himself in the fire. But instead, he took a seat. Our great and merciful Lord occupies a seat at the right hand of God in a work for our sake, for our safety and sanctification. When we sin, he in essence looks at the Father and says, he's mine. So no, he didn't take off his human suit. And he's in no way less than the Father by the seat he occupies as the God-man for our sake. You know, it's kind of like when, when a lieutenant at my station calls in sick. My captain has to occupy the lieutenant's seat to take over his duties. That doesn't change his authority as captain. It doesn't make him less than other captains. He's merely taken on the lieutenant's role for a time. So in a sense, maybe he becomes the captain lieutenant for the sake of the workers at the station. So Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's serving as mediator, but yet as God. Yet he is God. Also, Christ's position means he has authority to govern. <clears throat> we see this when Yahweh tells the Son in verse 2 to rule in the midst of your enemies. He rules and sovereignly governs his church for the good of his people. Also, sitting at the right hand of Christ means that his work on earth is complete and accepted. We see in Hebrews 1.3 where it says, When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. His sacrifice is a sweet-smelling aroma to God. Our righteous works are nothing but filthy rags. Our works condemn us. His work wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. Christ being seated is proof that he made good on his deal with the Father. What better than to set our minds and hearts on the fact that Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of the Father on our behalf. We're accepted because Yahweh has accepted his work, not ours. Let this fact fuel a desire for deeper communion with him. To set your soul on him and him alone. Pray that he would grant you holy desires to use all your strength and faculties to the glory of his name. That this may swell our hearts with gratitude for the one who sought us out because otherwise we would never have sought him. And though Christ being seated represents rest from his earthly work, his heavenly work on our part continues. Do you realize how constant this has to be? I can't walk out the house. I can't drive the, down the block without requiring the application of Christ's atonement for me. The whole thing is for us in his glory. As undeserving as we are, Christ serves as our high priest forever and king who governs all of our affairs. And so what are some benefits of Christ being seated at the right hand of God? Well, of course, they're endless, and they're worthy of your meditation, and I'm just going to share five. One, the Lord's people are protected. No weapon formed against us shall stand. Christ has sovereign rule and authority over all principalities and powers. We have a king priest who has covenanted to see us through to the very end. But does this mean we see no trouble? No. But what it does mean is that our troubles are not without a purpose. This protection may not meet your physical desires all the time, 
We may suffer here on earth in some way, but no one can take away your salvation. We're invincible until he says so. Man or demon have to get past him first. His kingship and priesthood is unchallengeable, and we are his. So we may, for his sovereign purposes, fall victim to evil here on earth, but we will never face eternal punishment from God. Because Christ sits on the right hand of the throne, making our salvation effectual and ordering history for our good. He has purpose to save a people, and no one can thwart his purposes. You are protected until the very end. Yeah, his enemies are yours. But on the flip side, our enemies are his. You're protected. Remember that kid on the block nobody wanted to mess with because of who his dad was? The biggest and baddest dude with, with the most notorious rep? And sometimes people from other blocks would mess with that kid simply because they just didn't know any better. Saints, we got the biggest and baddest father in all of the universe. And some fools might mess with us because they just don't know any better. They don't know that none can bring a charge against God's elect. That no one can condemn his people. That no one can separate us from his love because of him who is at the right hand of the Father. Number two, the result of that protection should be fearlessness. We should be free from fear. That boy on the block wasn't scared of nobody, not because he was tough, but because of who his father was. Don't fear the enemies of God. They are under the sovereign rule of Christ. There is nothing they can do that will catch God off guard or cause him to fumble. This protection we're under should move us to fearlessness in our godly duties. Don't allow fear to paralyze our service to God. The Lord tells Joshua, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Number three, the Holy Spirit. If Christ doesn't sit at the right hand of the Father, the helper doesn't come. He is the pledge of our inheritance, the down payment that keeps us ever looking forward to the completion of that transaction, the consummation of our salvation. Jesus said his leaving was to the disciples' advantage because otherwise the helper would not come. John 7, 39 says, But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Number four, Christ sitting at the right hand of God should move us to be bold. Why? Because it gives us an access that we wouldn't otherwise have. We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. He was tempted in all ways as we are and yet without sin. On account of Christ, our prayers can be heard and answered. You know, I don't finish my prayer and then say, in Nick's name I pray. Because otherwise, my prayer is going to stop at the ceiling. On account of Christ, we can come to him in repentance, make our petitions, inquire of him. His word says to draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Do you have confidence in the Lord? Do you think that your prayers are just saying words and that's it, that they're not reaching the ears of God? You know, oftentimes I, I, I think I feel that way. I have to remind myself of who God is. I have to have confidence in that, that it's truth that's unchangeable. Where I'm from, if you go into someone's house for the first time, you just don't go into that person's fridge and get whatever you want. That's just straight up disrespectful. There has to be a confidence that in a sense goes both ways. The owner of the house has to have reason to give you a pass, and the visitor has to be assured that his hand won't get chopped off if you reach for the Kool-Aid. And on account of Christ, both things are possible. The Lord sees you as one of his, and you are free to go into the fridge and have at it. Number five, Christ seated at the right hand of God makes us watchful for his return. Jesus will return once his enemies are made his footstool. And this is our blessed hope. This hope is a hope of assurance that just as he rose into heaven, he will return for us and receive us to himself that where he is, there we will be also. 
At his return, believers will be caught up in the clouds and be with the Lord forever. Then his word says, comfort one another with these words. We are to be comforted by the certain return of the Lord our God. One day we will bear flesh that is free to worship God without a sinful thought or desire to pop up in your mind. The inattention that we have through engagement with this sinful world, with our flesh, the devil and his demons will all be relieved. One day we won't be enticed to cling to worldly vices. One day sanctification will make way for glorification. One day, one very short day indeed. Do you yearn to be with your Savior? Are you on the watch for his return? This expectation of his return should also govern our conduct. How will you be found when he returns? And so... We've learned of the king's confession. We've discussed the king's position, which leads us to our third and final point, a king's rule. We're going to subpoint a king's rule, though, by breaking up this, 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 this section of the verse. All right? So it'll be easy. First subpoint, until. Second, I make. Third, your enemies. Four, a footstool for your feet. Until. David's use of the word until is not to say that after this event or consummation, the rule of, uh, the rule of Christ is over. That's, he's not saying that. <clears throat> this word here does not insinuate a limit. He doesn't, his reign is not going to cease. He has always reigned as co-equal with the Father, and in this office, his return will be the consummation of our salvation of his kingdom, there will be no end. Christ has secured our spot to be with him and reign with him. So it's not speaking about his reign ending after the father puts all under his feet. He's not a veteran who after leaving the military becomes, becomes a citizen. Until is to say reign with me in the midst of your enemies until I make your enemies your footstool. And then to say continue reigning would just be foolish because his reign will only be made clear. That in the midst of all the nations that reject them, all the opposition to the church, all the advancements of the enemy, no matter how defeated the people of God look to its foes, Christ ruled supreme the whole time. And all that until means is that afterwards, it's all going to be clear. Christ's feet will be at the top of the heap. It would all be clear that his kingdom was never shaken or caught off guard at all. But that it stood. And after until, there will be no more rivals. I make. The words I make mean to cause to be or to become. The Father is going to sovereignly bring about the defeat of the Messiah's enemies. They work harmoniously together in the government of the world and the affairs of providence. We see that Jesus says himself, my Father is working until now and I myself am working. So the co-eternal, co-equal Godhead are at work with the same purpose, his own glory and the church's good. He makes, serves to show that we can rest with certainty that every enemy will be subdued. The Father is on the job and there is no hostile opposition from a nation, individual, or spirit that can scratch the surface of God's plan. The Father's got it covered from the top of the throne to beneath the footstool. Even Christ was delivered by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. There's not a jot or tittle of this plan that won't be accounted for. This unified goal with the Father and the Son that has them glorifying one another perfectly. His kingdom, unshakable. His church, unstoppable. And what does this say to us? That while the state seems to be winning in its goal of secularizing the public square, and even to some degree the church, well... We know the truth. The church isn't going nowhere. You know, the Chinese Communist Party has been persecuting Chinese Christians since 1948. And guess what? They've only grown. Today, there's roughly 234 million Christians in China based on a yearly growth rate of 6.5%. So let's put that into perspective. There's 333 million Americans that populate the U.S. today. China has almost as many Christians as we have people. Again, I say, the church is going nowhere. 
But we can't sit on this and just twiddle our thumbs now, can we? The church is not meant to be on defense. It's the gates, hell, it's the gates of hell that won't prevail. Hell's not at the church's gate. The church is at hell's gate. And doesn't that seem obvious when you go into the public square to preach the gospel? Do you feel like you're at home? Do you feel like you're surrounded by a bunch of buddies? It doesn't feel like that, right? The church is meant to be on offense with the truth of the gospel. The Father's commitment to make his enemies his footstool should strengthen our resolve to serve him in all places. To remain uncompromising in these challenging times. You know, the friend of God has much to look forward to, much to be encouraged by, much to be emboldened by. In fact, the friend of God falls at the feet of Christ in worship when he faces him. But today, if you're an enemy of God, you should tremble at this psalm because the Lord will pull no punches against his enemies. Just listen to the words and ponder them deeply. First, verse 1, until I make, this will happen. Secondly, verse 5 says, the Lord will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. The King James Version renders it, the Lord shall strike through. It means that the Lord will deliver a death blow to his enemies. You will be crushed, pierced through, and made an example of. For while the saints will fall at the feet of Christ in worship, his enemies will be under his feet, serving as a footstool. But saints, let's not lose the image of this here. Will some of those enemies crushed and made a footstool of be people that you and I fail to share the gospel with? So brethren, there is great significance in I make. Because to the saint, it assures your place in the kingdom. But to the Lord's enemies, it guarantees your spot in the king's footstool. Your enemies. The word enemies carries the sense of an armed adversary, especially a member of an opposing military force, one who's in open hostility to another. And it can refer to individuals or nations. They're constantly assaulting the king of this kingdom. This is not a love tap. This isn't tough talk where someone's bark is worse than their bite. This is hatred that can only come from your very core. This hatred springs from the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent in the garden. We're closely related with this hatred because it's an inheritance of our first birth. Every denial of God's created order, attacks of his institution of marriage, refusal of his command to work, every signing of a wicked law of abortion in the name of women's health, all acts of idolatry, murderous acts that take the life of an image bearer of God, every rejection, every rejection of his, cra- his gracious provision of Christ, all are rage fuel assaults on God. Our sin, even even as Christians, are remnants of our hatred of God. (laughs) Are you yearning that glorified body yet? Every single attack upon his church are attempted strikes at God, and he takes it personal. The Lord is united to his people that whatever is done to us is done to him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul asks, who are you, Lord? To which Jesus replies, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. To my knowledge, Paul never, never laid a finger on Christ, but he sure was bent on doing damage to the church. Hence, the enemies of the church are direct enemies of God. Some of Christ's enemies have already been defeated. Satan is bound and his house is plundered, powerless to stop the advancement of Christ's kingdom. He's cast out, but he's not inactive. He is that serpent of old who's deceiving the world. We're in Satan's direct line of fire. Because all things are not yet put under his feet, under the Lord's feet. He's taken full advantage before he meets his reserved spot in that footstool. And this is why we need to put on the whole armor of God. That we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That we may be able to resist in that evil day. We don spiritual war gear because we we wrestle spiritual enemies. And we must be on guard at all times. Another enemy that awaits this day of his power is death. Jesus conquered death on the cross, and one day death will be abolished for good. All of Christ's enemies, and by default the churches, will be the material in the construction of the Lord's footstool. While this kingdom of Christ, 
of which we are his subjects, remains on earth, we will have trouble. You know, in this country, the dragon of persecution is really beginning to breathe down our necks. We've been the exception and not the rule for quite some time now. Our peace is being disturbed, and though it's not yet extreme, we don't like it. Some Christians have been willing to compromise clear teaching of Scripture in an attempt to preserve a peace that's just not there. Don't ever sign a peace treaty with an enemy that has no intentions of being neutral with you. I've never met a kid that's gotten some that didn't want more. The enemies of God are playing for keeps, y'all, aiming straight for your throats, and they'll smile at every inch of ground that you give up with every intention of getting you to give up more. Christian, we have to dig in our heels now. We have to stand firm. Our comfort here is not the joy set before us. Christ is. You know, if you walk through certain blocks where they don't know you, you can expect to get robbed. Since we are on foreign soil, we're in hostile territory. Expect attacks on his kingdom and expect them to heat up. Expect ridicule and assaults. Expect loss, but trust in your God. When you're weary, anxious, and in despair, remember that there is a king on the throne who is acting on your behalf. And he will one day put all under his feet. Every strong enemy will be conquered. Every sin accounted for. Every enemy of the church will be trampled underfoot. A footstool for your feet. Last sub point. Except for two times, once in the old and once in the new, the word footstool is used figuratively. And here it speaks of the subjection of one's enemies and complete control over them representing the triumph of one and the humiliation of another. Our Lord has been given dominion over all things. In reference to Christ, it points to his kingly office and rule. It points to his power and authority over all his enemies. It carries the idea of Joshua 10, 24, where the chiefs of the men of war put their feet on the necks of the conquered kings. And just as the heel of Christ delivers the death blow to the serpent's head, so will he put his foot on the necks of all his enemies. This is not a struggle. This is not going to be a wrestling match. God's not winning some, losing some. And there's no appeasing his wrath outside of Christ. So don't expect to bargain with God. He's provided the way. Christ, take it. He who sits as king is our only hope. All angels and authorities and powers have been subjected unto him. He sits as king, not only to rule and govern, but to judge. This verse speaks of, God, of God's judgment to the unbeliever. You who would not have Christ reign in your heart, you have aligned yourself with Satan. His subjection of you will be in such a manner that brings him the most honor and glory and you the most humiliation and disgrace. You will know you were wrong for rejecting Christ and it will be too late. For he would tread down the wicked. There will be ashes underneath his feet on the day which he is preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Today is the day of salvation. This is your certain end if you reject Christ. You know, I grudged against God until I couldn't no more. I finally cried to God in my mother's basement until I passed out. And the next morning, my shoulders felt light. That burden of sin had been lifted up. That condemnation had been canceled. His foot that was hovering over my neck had been removed, and I was reconciled. Don't become a footstool. Be ye reconciled to Christ. And to the church, Christ is king upon the holy hill of Zion. He is our head, and we must act as such. We can't give lip service to God. We're called to submit to his lordship, be careful not to treat God as common. David didn't say, the Lord says to that cool guy standing by him, he's not my homeboy. He's not to be made a caricature of or cheapened in any way. He's Lord. Is he yours today? Have you been living under his government or your own? Well, if you're purchased by, a blood, by his blood, he owns you. 
Shall he not have say over you? You know, countless laws days have started out on the wrong foot for me. A fight with the wife, stress with the kids, or just my own despondency that brings me to say this. I'm not going to church today. I'm too angry. I'm not in the mood. But at that point, who's Lord? Are we called to gather only if we feel like it? Who is Lord when you stay out of church on account of safety precautions? It doesn't say to gather unless COVID-19 is out there. Who was Lord when the state said we were not essential and most churches went along with it? Though I got to say, some of them churches that did close should have. <laughs> My feelings and emotions mean nothing in the light of God's commands. Let us go into his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. He has commanded us to not forsake the assembling of the brethren. And I don't know about you, but Zoom is a, is a very poor substitute. Very poor. You know, it becomes too easy for a common view of Christ to seep in. And I'll describe it. All right? We play the service, still in my PJs, brewing my coffee. During, so, during the song service, eating breakfast and checking Facebook during the preaching. And right after that, it's a nice smooth transition to Netflix. I know, it sounds crazy, but this is a reality. This is what's going on. Many Christians have bought into this new way. There's no focus in that. There's no accountability in that. You know, I have to get a sense of what my brother or sister's going through. You know? Where even if a word is not spoken, my heart is tugged to pray for one of you. I need, a hug. I need to hug my brother and sister. I'm a hugger. I want to hug. I want to shake hands. I want to feel you. Gather with them, worship alongside you guys, fellowship with you. Zoom has its benefits, but it's not a replacement. We can't adopt this as a new way. We don't deal the way the world does. And what about the ordinances? How are we going to baptize on Zoom? What about the Lord's Supper? Didn't they sit next to Christ? As soon as the state gets to govern when or how the church gathers, we've just switched lords. Not saying that we shouldn't be careful, because I know we should, but those who can should because you've been called to. The saints must be together. It's not an option. We are together and not be caught up in ourselves, but in the worship of our Lord. Well, in closing, saints, when the troubles brewing begin to heat up more, and they will, when the sin of anxiety and worry kick in, and they start keeping you up all night, put your head upon Psalm 110 and rest well. For the sun has been crowned, and every gospel promise and blessing flows directly from his throne. He is your salvation. Whom shall we fear? He is the stronghold of your life. Of whom shall we be afraid? He is head over the church with all authority and power at his disposal to take great care of you to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. Walk humbly before your God, submitting daily to his lordship. And lastly, if you're here or listening today and you don't know Christ, I just want to leave you a warning from Psalm 212. Do homage to the Son, that he not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Please repent, believe in the gospel, and acknowledge his lordship in your life, and take refuge in him. Let's pray. Father God, we just give you thanks for this time. And Lord, I pray that your word will fill our hearts, Lord, with, with, with a love and a desire to serve you well, Lord God. Let us retain your word, challenge us by your word, and encourage us, Lord, that we have a, a sovereign God who is here on our behalf to take care of us. And that we have a joy that is set before us. That sure joy. Oh, Lord, quicken us, Lord, to live that much more dedicated to you in light of these truths. 
We praise you and we thank you. In the mighty name of Christ, amen.